I'm at the uh, American Meat Science Association's Reciprocal Meat Conference in Manhattan, Kansas with Dr. Melvin Hunt, Professor of Animal Sciences and Industry here at Kansas State University. He's been named the recipient of the 2011 International Lectureship Award. And Dr. Hunt, this morning you gave us uh, sort of an overview on advances in meat science through international collaboration, specifically related to meat color. Can you talk just briefly about where some of the uh, notable international research is centered and maybe some differences between the EU and, and the U.S.? Well, in the United States, North and South America, there's a considerable amount of research that's being conducted, both from a very fundamental point of view and some of it very targeted to specific uh, color problems that everyone sees. And this is also occurring in the European Union and Asia and, North and, and uh, New Zealand, Australia. It's, it's around the world. Many times we have slightly different types of meat products, slightly different uses, slightly different packaging systems, and all of these need to have kind of specific oriented research in order to solve those color issues. Uh, so you also said, we, basically the bottom line is we, what we have to do is know how to manage oxygens and man oxygen and manage electrons. How do you incorporate that recognition from a meat science perspective into the more practical application at, at the plant level? Well, everyone basically knows if you cut your finger, the blood, blue blood turns red. Mm -hmm. The same is true with meat, except it's a different molecule. It's myoglobin rather than hemoglobin. The meat industry takes carcasses apart, they hit the air, and the, the meat will bloom to a bright red color. Packaging systems are therefore applied, and depending upon what the atmosphere is, there's a gradual transition of that bright color, red color. It will probably first, the color that I'll see is a brown discoloration. Then, depending on the atmosphere, it may turn purple or it may stay brown. And that's the real challenge of knowing when and where to have the electrons and oxygen be managed. And it's heavily dependent on, on the packaging as well. It's heavily dependent on packaging. It's heavily dependent on uh, how and when the carcasses were chilled. It's de there, there's probably 10 or 15 factors there that go all the way from farm production to the final packaging. And all those at different times are the critical checkers that are on the board that need to be moved around in order to give maximum color stability. Um, you compared color stability to a uh, Ferris wheel with a whole host of factors, but you said that the big three are oxygen consumption, met myoglobin reducing activity, and the post-mortem pool of NADH. Why is that? Well, as we said, when carcasses are, parts and pieces are created, they're exposed to air, and they turn a bright red or a pinky red color. That color has a short uh, color life, compared to some other pigments. And right. so to extend shelf life and freshness, they'll vacuum package it. As it's vacuum packaged, that red color will first turn brown in the package, and if the chemistry can handle the electrons properly, it will eventually reduce the pigment to the purple-red color. Then when it gets at a grocery store or another point of uh, supply, they may take it out of that package and the process sort of starts over again. And so you go through this cycle. The key to color stability is trying to decrease the number of color cycles that, has, that it goes through before it actually is put out into display. Okay. Temperature control is also a very critical factor. The research doesn't always turn out like it's supposed to. I think you mentioned that <laughs> during your, uh, your lecture this morning. Um, for instance, premature browning turned out to be a much bigger food safety issue than color quality issue. What, what's out there now in the research community that might be taking meat science on a bit of a detour? Well, I think the, the detours are liable to come, well, they're going to come from a variety of things. Everybody has got a different purpose and objective for doing experiments, and so we answer piece by piece by piece. And we are trying to become much more molecular, we're trying to, using a much more fundamental science to try to get at the actual mechanisms and what's going on in muscle cells relative to color. And so there's going to be new technology applied that won't work and will. And there'll be a, a, a variety of, of other issues that deal with oxygen management, with deal with cold chain management, 
purely the logistics of getting product from one point to another that extends the color life and shelf life requirements. We also need to be very cognizant of safety issues with uh, all of this and microbial control and the interventions of microbiology. Most of those substances that are used in microbial interventions are oxidizing types of substances that are harmful to color. Right. So there are sometimes we do things in the name of safety, but we hinder the color. The trick is to find out which ones do and which ones don't. Okay. Great, thank you and congratulations again. Thank you very much.